What's up, everybody? Jensen Cummings here. Thank you, as always, for tuning in. Today, we have an episode of Best Served Hot, hot food trends, unique foods, emerging cuisines, and we are talking to Chef Rosh today. Very excited. We're going to be talking a little bit about Cindy cuisine. I'm pumped up because I don't know anything about Cindy cuisine, so you are going to educate me. You're going to educate us, which I know is a big part of your mission. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about you, kind of what is your big picture thinking, the ethos, and then we'll kind of get into your backstory a little bit, but tell people what we can expect from Chef Rosh. Um, my mission and the past four years of my career is putting Cindy food on the map and sort of bringing it to, um, to North America and even around the world, just getting people familiar. I think a lot of people know Indian food, Northern and Southern, and they don't really know Cindy food, um, Indians included. Uh, so that's sort of my mission to, to, or has been my mission to be able to, to sort of introduce that and be able to, um, make it a familiar cuisine. I really appreciate that because to that point, I, I know Northern and Southern, I've never heard anything besides breaking it into two parts of the country, which right. a massive country with so much heritage, so much connection to food. Right. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So I'm excited about that. And the second we connected, I was like, yes, I need to know more about this. The big question for us always is why? Why Cindy Food? Why is that an important mission for you? Uh, I, I mean, my background is Cindy, which is um, originated in, in modern day Persia, uh, Iran, and moved through Pakistan and now in India. Um, and it is a culture. It is not a religion. It is a culture. It is what I was born and brought up in. Both my parents are Cindy. So for me, growing up, it, I just thought everyone knew, you know. Um, and I so just thought, okay, you know I'm Indian, so therefore you should know I'm Cindy. And there's so many different cultures um, within India and Pakistan, whether you're Punjabi, Gujarati, South Indian, whatever it may be. Um, and Cindy is the second smallest culture Um within the South Asian culture, um, Zoroastrianism being, being the first. So for me, um, growing up, I didn't really think much into it until I got older. And then I really said, Hey, you know, I'm a chef. I know a lot about Indian food. Um, I know a lot about my food, but people don't know about it. So throughout my culture, uh, throughout my career, I really have strived to, to whatever sort of food I put on the plate to have, um, some sort of ties with my background. Well, so let's let's take us back. Give us a little bit of the, the journey. We love the backstory. When did you ca catch the hospitality bug? When did that start for you? First job in the industry. First job, I was 12 years old. I was a bus person at a local diner. Um, I was too young to get in the kitchen. And the guy, yeah. the owner was like, you're just too young to get in the kitchen. You can bust tables. And I was trying to sell. You were too young to work at a restaurant at all, but you at know. All, right? But we'll put you at clearing tables because you're this cute little girl. And, yeah. uh, you know. But Where I was that? Uh, this was in my in right close to my home, walking distance to home. I'd go in every weekend, and I'd go in early, and I'd sit on this big chest freezer in the Greasy Spoon Diner and just watch the line cooks. Um, right. And I learned how to make a flat top omelet, and you know, it just was anything I could do, kitchen related, and that's sort of where the bug started. And um, throughout high school, all my part time jobs were kitchen related, university, all of them, and then obviously culinary school. Did you did you know right? It sounds like you knew right away that this is what you wanted wanted to do. But was it clear that it was going to be a career or just something you were kind of in? I, you know what? At twelve, I didn't even know that there was such a career right. um, as being a chef. You know, I, I didn't. I just wanted to cook, and that's all I wanted to do. And um, you know, even throughout high school, it was. And coming from a South Asian family, it's like doctor, lawyer, engineer. And, you know, I would have my own friends sort of laugh at me, my siblings as well, like, you want to be a chef, like, what is that? Um, and that just made me strive for more. And after university, I literally, you know, looked at my parents and said, hey, I'm, I got accepted to culinary school. This is, I'm going. And um, after culinary school, I sort of packed my bags and moved and I moved around the world until I could make something of myself. Let's talk about the journey. I think travel is so important. I, I think the more people that you meet, the more culture that you're introduced to, the more food Absolutely. that you eat across the table with a human, it is so hard. You may disagree, but it, you can never hate somebody if you've had a meal with them. I truly, Absolutely. truly believe that. So let's talk about travel, maybe a couple of places that you went and who you got to interact with, because the food's important, 
but who gets the food to the plate is much more important to me. And it sounds like to you as well. So take us through a couple spots, highlights of the journey. Sure. So my first job out of culinary school uh, was pre-opening team with our Hyatt, the Hyatt group um, in Asia. And I got the opportunity and I got a two year work visa and I went. And um, like you said, it was the people. It was uh, people from all different walks of it around Asia. You know, they looked at me like, why would you come? Um, from North America here, like we're striving, we're trying to get out there. and you're here. So I was already like, like black, blacklisted, um, mm-hmm. to, to be anyone's friend, so to say, but it was that it was a community. It, I learned the language. I lived the lifestyle. Um, you know, and it was that it was the people and being, you know, we were in Goa, which is, um, on the Arabic sea, basically. So lots of seafood, but people from all different walks of Asia, so trying their food and learning about their cultures and how they came and why they came to work. Um, And it was fun to hear. They're like, this for us is like going abroad, you know, Um, going to a resort property where we're going to meet. And their dreams were to meet like a customer or um, a client from somewhere that would say, hey, come be my personal chef sort of thing. Interesting. That was like a, a cool. set trajectory for a lot of people. Was like, find the person that's going to take you to the place that you're meant to be. To oh, that's very interesting. So, so I'm guessing that the Hyatt and even where you were, Cindy Cuisine was not a part of the equation, right? Not at I mean, all. Like, it's barely like coming on board now. So what were you cooking at that time? Um, so being a, um, a resort hotel, there was eight different restaurants, all different cuisines. Um, and I, I wanted to, I went to my executive chef and I said, I want to bounce from restaurant to restaurant. I want to learn it. It's scratch base. Five star hotels in Asia are untouchable or uncomparable to what we have here. Yeah. Um, everything yeah. was scratch based. We had our own butcher shop in the hotel. We had our own commissary. So I, I told my executive chef, I was like, I want to bounce and I want to learn and I, I, I want to absorb as much as possible. Um, you know, I want to be able to go fishing in the morning at 3 a.m. and catch the lobsters. I want to be able to butcher. I want to, you know, do every part of anything, you know. Um, and I was able to do that. And that was sort of, I mean, they had local cuisine, go in cuisine, which is more seafood, spicy. They had Italian, uh, Mediterranean. So basically any sort of cuisine you could think of. It, but not silly food. Um, and I wasn't even at that point in my career, I wasn't even thinking that I need to put my food on the map. Um, I was just thinking I need to make something of myself and I need to prove to my family and I need to prove to the people back home that, Hey, this is a really respectable career choice. And, um, you know, I am going to make a difference in the culinary world. It's just, I need time to do that. I need to learn the fundamentals. I need to learn the basics in order to be able to do that. And my sort of, strategy was let me work around as many countries as I can uh, and gain that knowledge and that uh, experience of the different cultures, the different cuisines, the different way of life to be able to respect it more. I like it. All right. Just give me like two or three places that you're like, you have to go there because you will absolutely love the people and love the food. Where are a couple of places that Uh, you say are the best of the best for you? Goa is definitely top of my list. Singapore, Bangkok, um, are definitely the top three um, in for overall experience. Ooh, yeah. Living the local life, the people, the culture, those are the top three. Like I've been there so many times and and it's still my bucket list, so to say, because there's so much more I can go and see and do and learn. Yeah, you could be there a lifetime and not absorb all Absolutely. the food, all the culture. Uh, it makes a ton of sense to me. You had something to prove, right? You got a little bit of a chip on your shoulder. I like that. You you weren't the prototypical early generation immigrant <laughs> story, especially, you know, from you mentioned South Asia, where it's lawyer, doctor, yeah. engineer, and education is the unlock to the American dream. All of that dynamic right. at play. Yet you still had that drive and the intensity. You applied it to something else. Was there a moment for you where your family or even yourself accepted like, you have what it takes. You're just doing it a different way than we are. Was there a moment where there was that, that like connection where this is what you're meant to do and that's okay. That's what you're supposed to be doing. It was honestly, um, and I, I have a lot to thank for this. Um, it was honestly after my first food network appearance that my family sort of saw, 
okay, wow, you know, it took them that. And it wasn't because they were closed minded. It wasn't, this was, they came to this country to have a better life and an easier life and provide an easier life for their children. And they saw me struggle. Of course, as a chef, you worked every shift. I worked night shifts in hotels every hour, every ho holiday, blah, blah, blah. And they didn't understand why would you choose this? You know, we have set up a path for you to make an easy life, so to say, um, or an easier life than what we had. Why aren't you taking it? So it really took them to see, you know, national television to sort of prove it. And I think, you know, avenues like Food Network, T uh, Food Channel, et cetera, et cetera, because they educate the people that might not um, be as accepting to a non-mainstream profession. Yeah, it makes sense. There's a little just like assigned credibility based on the platform. And absolutely, really, uh, it's interesting because you got that opportunity and you got some validation, uh, I would say, like a little absolutely. bit. And then you were on a path because you've been on every possible network and channel. And show, like, <laughs> like you've been uh, on all of them. Uh, every time I turned around, I was like, oh, there's Rosh again. So clearly you caught the bug of like, let's get out there and promote from the platforms that are out there and you have personality, you got something to say, like all of that was at play. So talk about the experience and maybe even if there's some experiences that you would have done it differently over again, give us a little bit of insight into kind of the, the TV chef lifestyle that you sure. were on that path for sure. Sure. I mean, for honestly, the, the, what got me to do my first show, which was chop, was I was watching it and, you know, I, I like a lot of people at home watching it, screaming out ingredients and then, you know, friends and family suggested, hey, apply. And I said, ah, I'm never going to, I don't know how this works. I'm never going to get selected. They're not going to choose me. Um, and obviously that I was wrong and I was very grateful for that. Um, and after that, it was just like, okay, I, I, I now need to use this avenue to promote my culture and my cuisine you know, okay, great. Yes. I'm an Indian female that made it to food network. One of the first great, you know, um, early two thousands. Now I've done that. Now let me put our cuisine on, on national yeah. television. And that was sort of my path. And that's sort of, um, my reason behind it. Like there is a lot of flack for to chefs that have been on TV, obviously through industry. Uh, and it's really, what is your motive behind it? Like, why are you doing it? Are you doing, you know, and everyone has a different reason. For me, it's, you know, I'm one person, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to reach as many people as possible, as many avenues as possible. And this is, um, help me do that. This is a platform that has helped me and is help, and, and continuing to help me, um, be able to put my cuisine on the map. You said, uh, you know, you didn't think they were going to pick you. Then you also said that, you know, a Indian female early on, way early on, early 2000s, right, where there was no, there was no diversity, no right. representation whatsoever. That wasn't even part of the conversation yet. Yeah, still struggling with it today. At least it's a part of the conversation. Do you take on the responsibility that your voice now is more than your voice? Absolutely. I think for me, it was the first show that I did. It was, uh, I'm doing this to educate minorities to, uh, like, you know, immigrant minorities to say, hey, it's okay that your child has picked something else other than a mainstream profession. It was more that, like, look, you know, I'm doing it and it's, it's very respectable. Um, I enjoy what I do. I'm making a career out of it. And that was sort of my motive for the first show. Like, let me get out there and help people that were in my position a few years ago that are struggling with their families or society or communities to say, whether it's to be a chef or anything that is out of the norm um, and sort of do that. And it became, yes, you know, and I, the feedback that I got back after that, after my first appearance to date, you know, 10 years later, 11 years later, it's like, you know, I made my parents watch your episode and now they're cool with me becoming a chef. And that's like, that was my motive behind it. Um, it wasn't a win or lose. Obviously, uh, you know, people who follow me know that um, I've lost more competitions than I have won. And that's OK, because my message is getting out there. And yes. that's what it's about. I like that. All right. Cindy Cuisine, let's dig into this a little bit. Absolutely. At the top level, you mentioned it's a culture, right? Very right. specifically. Right. Give us a couple of highlights when you are first telling somebody Cindy Cuisine, 
what the hell is that? What are a couple of the top ticket items that you're like, this is what it represents. And then let's, we'll dig in deeper and talk about kind of the relevance. So what, what are a couple of the top items you're, you're describing? Sure. I mean, even when I'm talking to uh, an, another Indian person, they're like, wow, we, we don't even know that you guys exist. Like, what is that? And it's sort of telling the background, like, hey, we originated in Persia. Um, so we have a lot of that influence in our food, the floral influence, um, cardamom, saffrons, uh, dry fruits, all that stuff. Um, and we moved, we peddled our way through Pakistan. And then after the partition in 1947, our grandparents peddled their way through India where, you know, our parents were born. Um, but taking that culture with us and how it differs. I mean, when someone thinks of North Indian food, they think of butter chicken or chicken tikka masala. Someone thinks of South Indian food, they think of doza, um, you know, coconut, spicy food. Um, and Sindhi cuisine is, as I said, floral, more earthy, more aromatic, um, rich, um, lots of goat, lots of mutton, uh, lamb, things like that are used. Um, and we just use the spices around us, cinnamon that's grown, um, cardamom teas, a lot of teas are used as well. So it, um, fenugreek, things that you don't really find, I mean, it's sad, but again, it's uh, it's us as Indian chefs working on it. When people think of Indian cuisine, they think curry and automatically, hey, I, I can't tell you how many people I've met. So, I don't really like Indian food because I don't like curry or I don't like spice. Right. And it's not the heat, it's the spice of flavor. Um, and that's sort of, again, um, a misinterpretation. Understood. Geog geography, just tell us. So Sindhi people are, though, in northern India or are they uh, spread, spread all out. So yeah. we're basically um, Sindhi people in India are um, immigrants to India. Yeah, understood. Believe it or not. Um, so during the partition in, in 1947, a lot, um, especially Hindus, had to uh, leave Pakistan and um, go to India. So um, refugee camps were opened up for Sindhis um, within India. And so now they're spread out throughout, obviously, throughout the world. But throughout India as well, you can't say um, we're a certain, like, for instance, my mom was born in South India, born and raised in South India, and my dad was born and raised in Mumbai. So there's a huge difference, um, you know. And now, even though we are the second smallest culture, um, South Asian culture, we are the most widespread throughout the world. Because displacement, you, you hear that story Just a lot. Displacement, oh. and we are known as business people. Uh, as businessmen, so um, I mean, you sorry, you'll find Sydney people in Hong Kong and South Africa. Um, I mean, family alone, I have family spread out throughout the world, so I'm blessed that way. Um, but just wherever we could go and um, take that with us, uh, both my grandparents are, are business people that traveled around India, and then their their children traveled around the world. Um, I have cousins that are South American, cousins that are Jamaican. Um, cousins that were born and raised in Singapore. So it's really cool to be able to see like one of the smallest cultures just so yeah. widespread. I want to go to the uh, family reunion cookouts with <laughs> your family. That sounds amazing. Let's dig into specific dishes a little bit. You gave us a high level floral uh, right away when you're talking about goat, mutton, you're talking about some of those spices. I very much think Persian, Iranian, then like so so there's a little bit of that influence there and then i'm sure that there's some strong indian influence kind of give Absolutely. us some of the dishes let's talk about two three dishes that really represent to you what cindy cuisine the potential that it has and why we should be paying attention sure one of the ones that are sort of familiar to people that there's different variations of is biryani yeah uh but the difference with cindy biryani is it is it, it is a stuffed so we'll take a goat and we'll stuff it with chicken. We'll take that chicken and stuff it with quail. Take the quail and stuff it with eggs. So sort of like a turducken. I was just about to say, turducken, eat your heart out. That sounds amazing. <laughs> right, but within a biryani. Um, and it's not spicy heat-wise. It's spicy floral. So a lot of dry fruit, raisins, nuts, um, cardamom, cinnamon. Um, that Tell me about biryani. What, what, what is that dish for people who don't? It is almost um, the best way to translate it is an Indian paella. Yeah. or South Asian paella. It is a rice-based dish, but the raw rice and the meat, uh, raw meat, are cooked together. So you have the layers of flavor. Um, and that's the difference between a Sindhi biryani and any other biryani where they par cook the rice and then cook the meat separately and bring them together. This is 100% raw to raw product. Interesting. Is there a uh, cooking vessel that is traditional to that dish? 
traditionally it's clay pot um, mm -hmm. on, a, on a fire, um, you know, and almost every Cindy household has a biryani pot. That yes, I, I figured that was the case. <laughs> So I often the cooking vessel pot. and the dish are synonymous with each other. Absolutely. So I'm very interested in this dish because now it very much feels like the dish that the family cooks all day together. And there's things happening around the cooking of that dish. Talk about the dynamic around that dish because the dish is important. What the humans do with that dish, interacting with each other, leading up to that dish, and then having that dish for dinner or whenever, whenever or whatever that is, I think is maybe more important. Talk about what happens around the beer. I, mean, I, can, I can speak for my family and I know um, for us when we were, you know, my mom would say probably on a, on a Thursday or Friday, Hey, this weekend, we're going to cook goat biryani. And we would all like our mouths would start watering from like Wednesday, Thursday onwards. Yeah, my mouth is watering order, right now. Oh, <laughs> order the goat. And you know, it would be a process like on, if we're eating it on Sunday afternoon, Saturday morning is when the marination is getting done. The rice is being rinsed numerous, numerous amount of times so that it's a clear water. You like know, sushi long, grade, like you're washing and washing and washing rinsing and, and rinsing. washing, washing, yeah, love it. long, long grain basmati rice, um, you know, and it's then layered in when it's ready to cook. It is layered the rice, then the um, saffron, the all the spices, the marinated goat, the rice, the saffron, the nuts and then fried onions in between each layer, caramelized fry onion. And then the top, you seal the lid with dough to capture all the steam, the moisture, everything yes. like that. Um, and traditionally you'll put hot charcoal on top if it's cooked outdoors. Um, obviously indoor, my mom would put a weight on it. And then um, the final touch is uh, dried fruits, fresh cilantro, fresh mint and um, fried onions. So, and that was the meal. Like there, the only accompaniment was a yogurt raita sauce. Um, and we would wait and wait and it was enough for the neighborhood, you know, um, happened maybe once every two months, um, for a goat biryani or mutton biryani, chicken biryani more often. Um, and it is that it was, those are some memories that of a childhood that, you know, it's just great. Like any event that I do, I try to incorporate biryani in different, different forms, different aspects, because that is um, really just like a memory that I want to pass on. Yeah. It's a memory. It's a memory it's of a people, memory. interactions. That's what food is. It's a memory. Yep. You're experiencing it again and again. It always harkens back to somewhere. So I'm fascinated that. And, that you, is and you eat it with your hands. You eat it with your hands. Yes. Like that's the only way. That's the, the only way. The right way is you eat it through your hands. And, and I've eaten with my hands quite a few times. It's, I was very clumsy at it when I started. There is some serious technique and I there got really competitive technique. about it. <laughs> and now I'm, I'm now I'm pretty good at eating with my feet. Very, like we have the dexterity as yeah. chefs. So you have, total you have tangent to there. The Take us, yes, it's about forming. Anybody who makes nigiri would be pretty good at it. You, exactly. It's all about forming your food and creating a vessel. That's the gateway. Let's talk about the other end of the spectrum. What are some really geeky stuff? Let's chef out a little bit for a minute. What are some things that you go, this is next level. This is you going all the way down the rabbit hole of Cindy cuisine. Give us a couple dishes on that end of the spectrum. Sure. So what I have been doing the past couple of years is sort of taking Cindy cuisine and my geekiness comes out as like, how am I going to make this as a plated dish? You right. know, because it's always family. So I only we've only ever ever eaten family style. So even in Indian restaurants, if you go to even today, ninety nine percent are family style. It's a call again. It's a culture. It's a memory. It's what brings us together. Um, being able to do the beard house, it was all plated, and it's like how do, and that was the hardest part. Everyone's like, how was that experience? And I was like, it was great. What was the hardest part? was how do I make this beautiful on plate per person? And that's sort of the geekiness in me. And my, and my staff knows, oh, chef is plating. Okay, well, let's give her a stack of plates and leave her alone. And it will take Space, me give the artist some room plate. to work. Yeah. yeah. And um, it's how do I make okra look pretty on a plate? You know, and, and, that's not, not, easy. and not bastardizing the flavors or the cooking technique. Um, I want to use the most traditional cooking technique that I grew up with, the flavors that, that even if my grandparents are sitting in front of that meal with maybe two okra on the plate being modern, can close their eyes and eat it and say, wow, this is what we made. It just looks so different. 
I like that. So the James Beard House, uh, I know you got to cook there consecutive years, which is very important to you. For them to create a platform that then you can continue to share, I think is very, very important. The last couple of minutes, I want to talk about some more people, humans, unsung sure, hospitality sure. heroes, as we call them. Just so many people in the trenches that have been there throughout our careers that are there today, allowing you the opportunity to be able to share your cuisine, your culture, all of that. Give us a couple of people. Who are some people that we need to be introduced to who just kick ass and we need to know it? Um, I'm big on promoting female chefs. Like even at the Beard House, I had an all female team, uh, all minority team. I think that, that that for me is something, again, that I, that's near and dear to me. Um, that I didn't have growing up in the industry. I didn't have that support system, um, that backbone. And here we have such a great network of minority chefs and female chefs that we all try to work together. Um, sister chefs, Erica Klein, Vicky Colas, they are some of my sister chefs. We have done the Minority Summit together. Um, Preeti Mystery is another one that's a sister chef. Of course, Manit Chohan, another one. Um, these are all influential females in my career that um, I've sort of either worked with before uh, or continue to work with um, today that really have the same vision. Um, and it is just that. It is um, being able to promote the sisters within the, within the industry. It is not a competition. You know, we, we're not in competition with each other. We're not in competition with anyone. We want, our, our only competition is to show that we are this equal you know, to anybody else in this industry. And that is what we're trying to do. And for years, and it's still, like I got this question a couple of weeks ago on another interview, like, is it still very male dominated? It is, but the culture is getting better. Um, it's sad that over the past four years, it's taken such um, dramatic and such drastic um, sort of uh, issues to make it that way, or, you know, um, negative issues to be able to, finally say, okay, yeah, it's getting better. Um, it should have never been that way, but that's what we strive to do. Um, another influence that um, is no longer with us is Chef Floyd Cardo's. He was, you know, a person that I went to at 16 years old to Tabla and said, I want to be a chef. I need you to give me an internship sort of thing. And he sat me down and, and you know, he gave me the real, you know, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly of the industry and said, if you're still okay with this, then definitely. And um, I can still remember sitting in his office and talking to him about that as a blinded 16 year old that just said, I need to leave home and become a chef. And you're an Indian chef and I've been following you. Um, and I want to do the work that you're doing. So he's someone that is super, super influential to me, still look up to. Um, and, you know, is, is just for our industry in general, for South Asians in this industry, what even not like he, ha he was great. He had a lot of influence and he was a great trendsetter. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what, what he did at Tabla and the Bread Bar beyond that, like, yeah, changed everything yep. about food. I, I truly believe that, especially again, to your point for Indian, South Asian, and even me, like, it, you never know how people are going to influence you. Floyd Cardo's yep. never met Floyd Cardo's, yet I'm big, big, big into beer. I've done over 50 collaboration beers. And the first beer I ever saw was he did a collaboration beer with Brooklyn Brewery where he brought Indian spices to a beer. I'd never seen anything like it. I tried it. It changed my life forever. Right. I just think it's important to understand the influence that we can have on each other. Again, Absolutely. you're using that platform and the opportunity to have that influence on others and to bring your voice, which is no longer just your voice. It's the voice of South Asians, of Cindy people, of Indians, of women, of minorities. And I really, really appreciate that. Last couple seconds, any parting thoughts that you have for us? Great conversation, by the way. Thank you. I would just say, guys, in this, in, in, in the um, situation that the world is in right now, um, try your hardest to support local um, as much as possible. Um, donate as much as possible. Um, you know, even if you're not a chef or if you're not in the industry, um, donating meals to frontline workers, um, donating groceries or anything like that is the biggest thing we can do right now. Um, I know as a chef in the industry, I just now started back work last Monday. So three and a half months, um, I was, all I was doing is how can I, and, and like many people, the first four days when I, when this started, I said, oh my God, the, I can mope around. And I moped around for four days. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going from a salary to nothing. Yeah. What can I do? What can I do? And then finally I was like, you know what, in 20 years of my career, uh, I've never really given back, so to say, 
Um, yes, I volunteered my time. I volunteered my services, blah, 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 blah. blah. But I've never really given back where people at this time really need it. And I spent the three and a half months, and I'm continuing to do it, is, is donating meals and things like that. And it's really made me realize that, you know, uh, beyond, I mean, frontline workers go beyond, hospital workers go beyond nurses. Um, I've donated meals to supermarkets because, to me, they are the most hardcore workers. Like, there's, they're people that haven't stopped. They've taken our abuse. They've taken our verbal abuse, our physical abuse in some, in some places. Um, so just just support each other. I mean, there, we can come out of this a lot stronger, uh, a lot better people, um, a lot more loving and caring for each other and be safe, wear masks, you know, let's get the, the numbers down. Let's get them flatlined. Um, you know, and just take care of each other. That's it. I absolutely love it. And I, I think through Cindy cuisine, through any cuisine that's relative to you, find humans to, quote unquote, break bread with, I'm telling you, it's the way that you will yes. care enough to take care of people. I'm, I'm all in. Rosh, I really appreciate the time, the insights. Thank you in- so much for having me. Oh, super great. All right. I appreciate you. You have a great day. Thank you so much for being you on. You too, guys. Be safe. Thank you. All right, cheers. All right. Cindy Cuisine, really inspiring stuff. I think that there is a huge opportunity at this moment for us to start to include more and more and more cuisines, which thereby means more people, more humans in the conversation, I think is the way that we're gonna continue to evolve in this industry. I'm a big buyer and believer in that. And the fact that Rosh is out there doing that work is so, so important to me personally, to best served and to the hospitality industry as a whole. So thank you everybody. Great show today. Really appreciate everybody as always. As Rosh said, take care of each other. Cheers.